Hello everybody, Dave Butler is my name. I'm a safe electric inspector. With me here today I have John Cotter and Seamus Green who are also safe electric inspectors. We're here today to talk about the upcoming changes to the national wiring rules. The wiring rules in Ireland were previously ET101, which is this edition of the wiring rules. They were introduced in 2008. They have been amended on a number of occasions since then. But over the next two years, ET101 is going to be replaced with this book, which is IS10101. The IS stands for Irish Standard. We're going to produce a series of short webinars to bring you guys who are registered electrical contractors up to speed with the changes in this book that are going to affect your everyday business as you carry out your work as an electrical contractor. Our role is to teach you, educate you, and help you to understand these rules to make sure that your work is in compliance with the rules. Uh, the wiring rules, the new edition, can be purchased from the NSAI, not from Safe Electric, that's important to remember. There's a link on the Safe Electric website to bring you straight into the online section to purchase the wiring rules. And it's important, uh, as soon as possible, everybody gets a copy of the rules to have them themselves for referencing. We're going to focus in on the top 10 or 12 changes to the rules that are going to affect everybody on a day-to-day -day basis. And one of the big changes is a change to rule number 527, which determines the type of cables that we're allowed to use in electrical installations. I might pass over to John Cotter here now to explain that a little bit better and in a little bit more detail. Hi. Uh, yeah, Dave, there's a big change in the industry here. I suppose IS101 is applicable to all circuits from its nominal voltage to 1,000 volts AC and 1,500 volts DC. So with the new rule coming in, 527, which is basically to do with the cable and its reaction to fire. So what we're looking at here is the minimum requirement class, which is classed as DCA, S2, D2, A2. Now, this standard will only be printed on the drum or roll of the cable. It will not be printed on the actual cable itself. So the standard should be identified on the drum. For examples, all the different types of cable we're going to be seeing now will become PVC, 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 twin inert, or MYMJ, alarm cable, or data cable, and our coaxial type cable, for examples. Now, to break down the DC, A, S2, D2, and A2, the D is a grade. So A being higher, F being the lowest resistance to the reaction in fire. CA is for cable, S is for smoke, and D is for droplets, and A is for acid. So okay. again, this is a big change in our industry. And when you're buying your cable over the counter to our wholesalers, you have to be making sure that this is the cable we're buying and we're purchasing and installing in the installations when we're making the statement that we're carrying it out to IS10101. So it'll be very important, John, to check with your cable supplier that you're ap actually getting the cable that is marked with this. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. As a, uh, uh, so if the declaration is, I am installing my installation to IS10101, you have to make sure that you see this DCA, S2, D2, and A2 stamped on the drum or on the reel of cable. Uh, another big change that's going to affect everybody is the mandatory introdu introduction of RCD protection on lighting circuits in domestic premises. It's important to understand this rule only applies to domestic premises. Uh, this will affect everybody, and Seamus is going to talk a little bit further about that. Yes, Dave, as you said there, this one was well flagged. Um, RCD protection is already in uh, domestic installations, but only in bathrooms or rooms that contain baths or showers. But we're going to move that now, and we're going to have every lighting circuit within a domestic installation covered by that. The other wee change there is the bathrooms won't, no longer will need to be dedicated. So that's important that you now will be able, when you're first fixing your bathroom, you'll be able to bring your ensuite in along with that. So when we do have RCD protection on lighting, we have to consider the hazard of one fault taken out an installation. So it's very important that we look at that. And it actually does state within the rules that precautions need to be taken in case of one fault leaving a hazardous situation. 
There's only one real way to provide this, and that would be by RCBOs. Um, there, is, there is another rule under uh, 314 within the rules, which uh, also refers to the same thing, that one fault would causing a hazardous situation. So I suppose to go over that again, Dave, RCD protection, as you said, on all, cir all lighting circuits in domestic installations, no requirement for the bathroom to be on a dedicated RCD, and just... Okay. That, uh, go ahead, Dave. And it's important to understand now that because the RCD requirements on lighting circuits are changing, in the old rules, we required it on outside lighting circuits and bathrooms only, or more accurately, rooms that contain a bath or a shower. In the new rules, they're going to be required on all circuits. You're going to have to make your decision early as to which version of the wiring rules you're uh, constructing the installation in accordance with, because you cannot mix and match the wiring rules. Uh, the recommended way that, as Seamus has, has mentioned there, to achieve the requirement with the rule is to just put a separate RCBO on every lighting circuit. In a normal domestic house, that'll be a RCBO for the upstairs lights and a separate RCBO for the downstairs lights. If you tie the lighting circuits in, for example, with the sockets RCBO, you are complying with the spirit of the rule, but that means if you trip the RCD uh, for example, if you spill water on the lead of your kettle in the kitchen, trip the RCD, now the lights go off as well. We want to avoid that situation, yeah, James. Yeah, very good. Yeah. Another point I just want to pick up on that you said there, Dave, and I think it's going to be very important going forward over the next little while. I suppose the two-year lead-in process here. When we come to an installation inspectors, I suppose one of the first questions we'll be asking you, will this be wired to fourth edition or to fifth edition? So, again, if you're wiring to the fifth edition, you don't have to put the bathrooms on a dedicated RCD, but if you haven't gone with, John spoke earlier about the changes to the cable, if you haven't gone and used that new cable, you need to continue with the fourth edition, and that yeah. will still need to be a dedicated circuit. You okay. may put the rest of the installation on lighting circuits on RCDs, but you will have to remain with the dedicated circuits. We might come across it a couple yeah. of more times during the rules. The other thing, uh, I suppose, about RCDs that comes up from time to time, is coming up, there's a change in the rules as well, where we have now encountering harmonics a lot more in our domestic installations coming from VSDs, variable speed drives, within washing machines and dryers. To, there's lots of non-linear loads now in an installation. So this requires us to use an A-type RCD. So what's the difference between an AC and an A? An A can handle these harmonics. An AC, mm -hmm. if there's harmonics present, basically leaves you an installation that may not have any RCD protection. So it's another point when we're looking into the RCDs that we and make sure that we have an A-type RCD yeah. on it. Yeah. I uh, suppose sometimes the best way I try to explain this to some of our contractors that we meet, the, the wording is actually remnants, where we have a DC fault current on an AC-type RCD, and what we've noticed is that it actually floods the tripping coil on the AC type RCD and could prevent it from an AC fault yes. from tripping from that. So again, yeah. even... And, and my, my understanding, uh, probably a, an even simpler way to explain it, is that the AC type RCD, which is the original type that was introduced 30 mm -hmm. or 40 years ago, only protects against AC faults. Correct. So yeah. if we have a variable speed drive or even a DC controller in a washing machine or a tumble dryer, you get an earth fault on that, the AC type RCD won't pick it up, it'll yeah. get flooded as you say John, and it won't trip. Mm. So we have developed, to counteract this problem, an A type RCD, which is basically a dual purpose RCD. Yeah. Mm. It yeah. will detect tri cur uh, fault currents on AC circuits, and it will also detect fault currents on DC circuits. Yeah. The A type RCD is the best of all worlds. Can I come in on that, Dave, as well? Just a little point about when we're testing an A-type RCD. When we're in a domestic or any type of installation, whether it be commercial or industrial, when we're carrying out our tests, the most likely is no harmonics present at that stage. So our meters are capable of testing mm -hmm. A-type RCDs, but it's very important that we have our meter on the right setting. For a mega, you will see the symbol with both the AC and the pulsating DC symbol within a rectangle. Other meters show it differently. It's very important to, infall, to refer to your instruction manual for your meter and know how to have it on the right setting. For instance, with the Megger, the double arrow button will adjust it from AC to A. Very important to be on that right setting. Maybe with some of the other meters, if there's different settings, for instance, on it's the Fluke, it's F3. Very important and that you're on that setting yeah. while carrying out that test. So you're 
local inspector who you guys should meet on a fairly regular basis will be happy to demonstrate how to set up your own test equipment to make sure that you're measuring uh, on the correct parameters. Sometimes uh, we get phone calls, uh, it seems that the device is faulty. It's not actually that the device is faulty, you have to make sure that your meter is set on the correct yeah. settings. Yeah. And I suppose to recap on that again, what we're talking about here is that uh, the new requirement will require all circuits within a, lighting circuits within a domestic installation to have RCD protection, and our preferred method would be RCBOs. Would you agree with that, Dave? Yes, yeah, RCBO on each circuit. Yeah. Uh, another important change that's coming in is there are some changes to the location and the height of uh, distribution boards. First of all, uh, the previous rule said that you couldn't have a distribution board under a timber stairs in a washroom or a WC and in a storage cupboard. Now, bearing in mind both sets of rules require that the distribution board is readily accessible, the storage cupboard uh, restriction has been omitted in the new wiring rules. Do any of you guys want to pick up on that and talk further about it? Well, go ahead, John. No, no, no go, go. <laughs> Well, I suppose the first thing the, the customer usually wants is the, the distribution board to disappear. We don't want to see that. We don't want to see that. You may know where your distribution board is. Your, your babysitter may not. And in the event of an emergency or something going wrong in that house, it is the distribution center of your house. And it's very important that we're able to get there, whether to be isolating a fault or to switch yeah. off somebody that's... I, I think the wording the contractor should use to their clients when ma mapping out their electrical installation is that it must be readily accessible to the end user. Yes. Exactly, John. Yeah. Yeah. It needs to be operated by somebody. If it's hidden, it cannot be operated. Mm -hmm. yes. And those RCDs need to be tested regularly. Yeah. Every six months is what the manufacturer would, would always recommend, mm -hmm. that the test button is, is pressed. And this, I think, was part of the rationale for dropping the distribution board in the previous edition of the wiring rules. The wording was that the top of the distribution board had to be 2.25 metres measured from the finished floor to the top surface mm. of the board. That's changing very slightly in the new rules. The measurement is changing to 2.15 metres, but the measurement can now be taken to the top row of MCBs. There is also a requirement that if your distribution board is less than 1.4 metres, it has to be accessible only to authorised persons, I think yeah. is the word that's in the right. room. And, and a key or a tool as well. And, and that operated. remains the same. That, that would be to prevent access by young children, would that be right, Dave? It's exactly the yeah, purpose yeah, of the rule. Yeah, yeah. So, it's so most of these rules do make sense. I suppose to summarise it, we need people to be able to access their distribution board mm -hmm. easily so they can test the safety devices which are ultimately protecting the installation and protecting lives in the installation. But we also need to restrict it from young children and unauthorised access. So the rules sort of give you a mix and a match in between both. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Labelling the distribution board as well, Dave, is a, a, a common one where yeah. it, is, it is carried out incorrectly. Again, I rephrase the word really accessible to the end user. Uh, the electrical installations are getting more complicated now with air to water heating systems, PV installations. So these boards need to be labelled to, to show these circuits. To, to, to the end user who yeah. might not have the knowledge and on resetting it. While the rule number for the labelling is changing in the fifth edition, the yeah. actual rule that you're required to label circuits doesn't uh, change in any no. way, I think. No. no, no, no. I hope you found today's uh, presentation informative, and I'd like to thank Seamus Green, Save Electric Inspector, and John Cotter for joining me today. Okay, the next test that I am going to demonstrate is the RCD tripping time on this radial circuit. For this test, I need to select the auto function on my test equipment. My RCD is 30 milliamps, which I have selected also on my RCD. The next step, I have also checked that this is an A-type RCD. If you notice, on the very bottom of my test equipment, I have selected a type. I now press the test button, which will carry me through the cycles and the test. And for my final test, I'll push the test button 
on the RCD itself. Okay, now we need to see what our results are to make sure that they are complying to IS 10101. Already, I can see here at times half that our RCD has not tripped, which is acceptable to IS 10101. Next, I am testing times one at zero degrees. This is telling me that I got 15.3 milliseconds. Our maximum, according to IS 101, is 300 milliseconds times one. My next is 27.5 at 180 degrees. This is the maximum times one, and this is the one that I will record on my test record sheet. The next is times five. The maximum allowance, according to IS 101, is 40 milliseconds. I have achieved 13.2 at zero degrees, and I have achieved 7.79 at 180 degrees. Again, I record the maximum reading I get on each cycle on my test record sheet. These tests are telling me that this RCD complies with IS 10101. Thank you.